draft science video. Yay! Anyway, to be serious, the snarky one is back again. <laughs> she's just so hopeless. Um, so anyway, uh, she did have an argument with some guy here about blah, 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 and equation, and blah, 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 and whatever, and who cares. Um, but anyway, so she see, says here, uh, reread my comment. You said uh, mathematical, but in fact, I wrote mechanical. All right, I made that correction in the video, so this is just more crap. You don't listen very well, apparently. Um, I clearly made the correction. <laughs> um, just a friendly suggestion. Yeah, fuck you. Please take a look. Please, in capital letters, take a look at some background on quantum physics before you share your amazing knowledge with the YouTube community again. Oh, I'm not allowed to share knowledge on a channel called Draft Science. That's what the channel's called, Draft Science. No, we're not even allowed to discuss an idea. That would be ludicrous. All right, well, anyway, this is a good video. This is pretty funny here. And then she posts a link to another book, another pile of shit book title. That's all she knows is book titles. You ought to read a book uh, instead of just posting titles. So anyway, we'll use my tool. See, I've selected the link address in a sloppy manner. Not even worried about all of the words. Just as long as I got the V in there. And then I hit my little tool. Look at that. The box loads. And bingo. Off we go. Um... So anyway, so here's a, here's a video. I'm going to let load this. The only part that we really need is the last part. Ooh, I've got the light. Um, is the, the light. We see the light. Um, you know, look, it's always about this. Here's a, this video anyway. It's got Niels Bohr and all the, the regular guys in here. Hassenberg and Schopenhauer, whatever. Um, but no Einstein, which is kind of a, right there, kind of a giveaway, isn't it? Um... But anyway, there's some um, physicist guy at the end, and I'll play his little clip because he sort of just says it, okay? He doesn't, he doesn't say it explicitly, but he says it pretty much explicitly. Look, this whole uncertainty principle thing is just that. It's a principle. It's like I can have two dice, and I can have a coin, and I can flip it. Guess what, okay? There's a probability because we won't know all the variables when I flip this. But the fact of the matter is... There isn't any probability. It will flip one way. Okay, I'll flip it. If the physics are going to be there. It's inevitable how that thing turned out. All right, there's no improbability anywhere in the process. From from the brain that triggered it to everything. It's, it's all, um, yeah, there's just no improbability. Uh, there's just no probability. It's a definite fact. And the same thing is true with this idea, this probability crap in quantum physics. It has nothing to do with the photons or electrons actually not being in a position. It has to do with the fact that we can't see their position without completely fucking them over, uh, screwing with them, <coughs> however you want to put it. Oh, this is taking forever. We'll just load somewhere around here and a little further. Yeah, this guy. All right, here we go. However, there was a, a certain amount of uncertainty with regards to where the particle was. Now, one day, Heisenberg was so paralyzed, worrying about all these problems, that he took a walk in the park. Outside his institute, there's a famous park, and late at night, he walked to the park. Oh, this is just so annoying when everybody has to do all this little personality crap. You know, you just can't get to the fucking point. No, you have to talk about, oh, and then he had a ham sandwich, and then he tied his shoe, and he said, oh, Eureka. Wondering, how can it be? How can it be that you don't quite know where the electron is? And then, in a flash, he understood. Because to understand where an electron is, you have to look at it. To look at it, you have to shine a light on it. But when you shine a light on it, that disturbs where the electron is. So the very fact of observing an object... Yeah, I mean, look, I love my analogy better, okay? It's like trying to figure out where a Volkswagen's going by throwing a Volkswagen at it. You can't really get away with that, can you? No, you can't. ...object changes its location. Therefore, he realized that uncertainty is an essential part of his picture. Yeah, it's an essential part of the human resolution. The human camera can't see. It's blind. So that's the only essential part. The uncertainty isn't a fact. It's just a fact 
of our lack of resolution. The fact that we can't dissect it yet. We don't have the tools or instruments capable of doing that kind of dissection. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle showed that it is fundamentally impossible to measure the position and the momentum of a particle at the same time with accuracy. Yeah, well, it's fundamentally impossible to do it with any of the tools we have now. We don't know whether these things might leave vapor trails. We don't know. There could be something out there, some sort of other kind of physics that we're unaware of that might allow there to be a fingerprint, um, a, uh, you know, a footprint. Um, but, yeah, the bottom line is it's, it, 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 that may not be true, and it may be that these are the smallest particles. There's no way to understand exactly what they're doing because there's no way... They're not going to tell you what they're going to do. And unless they tell you, there's no way for you to figure it out because you have no tool to, to hit them with. The more you know about a particle's position, the less you can know about its momentum. And the reverse is also true. The more you know about the momentum of a particle, the less you can know about its position. And when he finally had that idea, he realized that he could merge the Schrodinger picture with the Bohr-Heisenberg picture to give us the modern day theory of the quantum principle. In other words, the electron is a point particle. There you go. But you don't know quite where it is. There you go. You don't know where it is. It doesn't have a, it's not lost. We don't know where it is, but it isn't lost. It isn't floating around in an improbability wave. No, that's the only way we can see it as a, you know, a fuzzy fog, and, uh, but it has nothing to do with the reality. And the probability of finding it at any given point is given by a wave, the Schrodinger wave. Right, so it's given by a wave, but it isn't a wave. We're just using uh, a, a mathematical tool. Uh, uh, we're using an abstraction to define the reality because we can't see the reality. So we're defining the fog with which in the reality exists. We know we can put a we can put a, a box around it that's ten feet by ten feet, but we can't exactly say what's going on inside the box. We now have this beautiful synthesis of waves and particles. Right, but the waves are completely artificial. They're a contrivance of necessity. They have nothing to do with the actual circumstance. So enough of this crap. So yeah, you, so this was a really dumb link to point to because it just proves my fucking point. Um, <laughs> that uh, the only thing we have here is a problem understanding this physics because we can't see the physics. So we have to um, um, we have to think it through rather than see it through. Uh, all right. So anyway, so the part I want to get to. Um, so, so basically, yeah, so go back to starting again. Um, I like the idea of the clock speed thing, okay? The universe moves at the clock speed. Makes sense. You know, photons can't acquire momentum. They can't lose it. So nothing in the universe that is a something. Mm -hmm. um, everything is moving at the speed of light. It's all just made out of pieces that are moving at the speed of light. Not less than, not more than, just the speed of light. And they're moving... Uh, they're, they're, they're reacting with what I would call a void or a deficit or the negative space or the antimatter, whatever you want to call it, um, that has all the mass, that has all the gravity. So the particles have no gravity. All the gravity is in this, it's the nucleuses of matter, okay? Um, yeah. All right, so let's see if there's anything else that this brings up. All right, so anyway, I was having a problem with this magnetism thing. All right. Um, so again, the idea is is that what happened in the Big Bang was that space broke. <laughs> the theory is threw a bunch of marbles into space. Let's call them um, left holes behind. So let's even say golf balls. And the golf balls came down, and they can only do one thing, and that is run. They can only run at the speed of light. So they just they just run at the speed of light. And uh, the holes, okay, <laughs> that the golf ball left behind is essentially what the golf balls are trying to fall back into. But obviously there's a hole, and then there's a ton of empty space between the holes. 
So the odds of a golf ball just happening to bounce back into a hole is very, very slight. And they're more likely to, in their speed of light manner, interact with the hole but never be able to fall into the hole. Um, I don't think there's anything about what I'm talking about that um, would break the idea of standard orbits for um, atoms. Um, even our solar system ends up creating kind of standard orbits. It creates them artificially. Just, I mean, everything's happening in an atom at the speed of light, which is a lot different than here in space where things aren't traveling at the speed of light or anywhere close. So, um, it seems, uh, you know, like there would be um, collision space. So nothing could survive as a coalesced as, as a school of fish, for example, um, they would get broken up if they get too close together, if they run into each other or run by each other, they would rip fish out of each other. So theoretically, I don't see any problem with standard physics um, being applied Newtonian physics. The other problem with Newtonian physics is, yeah, it's dealing with this material world where, um, you know, planets decelerate as they're orbiting. Um, all kinds of other factors are involved, so it's very hard to get into a perfect orbit with no friction. Well, anyway, but we'll, I, I'll have to go through that one more because there's, you know, obviously there's details that are still missing. So anyway, but the thing I was thinking about was magnets, okay? And not so much this attraction thing, because that you can sort of get, right? I mean, you can sort of, okay, <laughs> it's attracting. The, the tricky one is this repulsion thing. I mean, that one just, you sit there and you say, how does it do that? I mean, how does it create this negative pressure? I and mean, it feels like negative pressure. I mean, when you push them together, you can almost feel the spring being pushed. You can feel the tension. You can feel the, 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 how it gets tighter. I mean, you know, this thing will shoot across the room when I've smashed these magnets together. I mean, you know, I can shoot that all the way into my hand. Um, it's a lot of pressure it builds up. And how is it doing that? What's that pressure made out of? How is how's it configured? And how does just flipping that magnet over change the whole ball game? I mean, how come? And so, guess I, this is what I thought of. I thought of magnetism. Like, let's say we go back to that spiral thing. And if you have, you, you know, it's almost like it's almost like on Earth, right? At the, in the northern hemisphere, the water goes down the drain clockwise southern hemisphere counterclockwise so if um, the orbital gravity or the field of an atom um, actually did have a coiled sp a spinning motion to it like a like the way water goes down and it was a spinning like a spring or like a screw all right what's happening with magnets is when the screws are opposite each other what they're doing is they're screwing into each other so you have this loop that's going this way and then a loop going this way and the two springs catch into each other they loop into each other and they pull each other into each other okay when they're when they're opposite if they're both going the same way if the spin is the same in terms of the the, the di directionality, then they can't go into each other. They can't catch into each other, so they can't pull each other in like two screws, like a screw going into wood. It won't be a screw going into wood anymore. Um, it'll be the opposite. It'll be like turning the screw backwards. And so then the two are going to repulse each other, but they're going to keep pushing out on each other. They can never push in on each other. And so when you force them together, you're basically collapsing that internal spring of that spiral. So there's a spiral inside, uh, and, you know, that's just getting smaller and smaller, 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 and it's just sticking out. So you got this cone of, of, of a coil that spins down, and you got a coil and it spins down. And like I said, when the two are going opposite directions, they'll screw right into each other, pull each other together. But if they're going the same way, you can't push them together. And what you end up doing is just pressing, pushing the spring together. So anyway, I like it. I mean, it might not be, you know, might not be a Nobel Prize, but I like this idea that that it really does explain this 
this pressure feel to it. You can really feel the spring. It's like there's a spring between the two magnets. And when they're the opposite, you can just feel them pulling into each other. So the magnetic fields are always turning, or the gravitational fields. Just depends on how we figure out what atoms are exactly doing. So that sort of ties them together, ties that. Uh, it makes more sense out of that attraction principle is if there's a coiled spring of a field, it will pull things into it. So if it's always spinning and it's got that edge, it's always out there grabbing. It'll grab something and it'll pull it into it. And by the same token, if the spin is the opposite of its coil, it will throw things out of it. Um, but figuring out how, you know, and, and why certain metals are capable of acquiring, um, you know, this this attribute of magnetism, you know, that's a whole nother question. I mean, obviously it has to do with the alignment of the atoms, but obviously it has to do with maybe they all have to be spinning the same way or whatever the other feature would be. But I'll have to think on that one. Yeah. I mean, maybe if they, they all do have a plane, you know, all atoms have a plane when they're spinning one way on one side and spinning the other way on the other side. And unless they're configured all facing the same way, you know, linearly, um, you'd never notice or something like that. Anyway, draft science. That's what it's called. Yeah, so anyway, I like it though. Yeah, I like it. So anyway, until next time. See if I can get a little more coherent.